Hello, grade five. This is our session for today. This is chapter three, lesson number one. Today we will talk about energy flow in ecosystems. This is page 142 in your textbook. This is the energy flow in ecosystem, this picture from your book. Let's start. What is an ecosystem? You are on a hike. Suppose that you are on a hike in a beautiful forest. What do you see? Yes, for sure you will see plants, including sprouts, trees, windflowers, and the grasses that grow along your path. Also, you will see the chipmunks scurry across the trail and the birds fly overhead. All these are living things. These are some of the living things, or we will give them the name biotic factors for the of the environment. Plenty of non-living things or abiotic factors, this is so important, are also in view. The fresh air that fills your lungs or that you breathe, also the rocks that lie on your trail, even below you hear the gurgle of a nearby stream filled with water. All these are abiotic or non-living factors. Okay, together these biotic factors like the plants and the animals and the abiotic factors like water and rocks and so on, these factors make up the forest ecosystem. So what is the meaning of the word the ecosystem itself? An ecosystem includes the living and non-living things in an environment. An ecosystem includes all the living and the non-living things in an environment. So do you mean that the ecosystem also includes all the biotic and abiotic factors in an environment? Okay. The biotic and the abiotic factors in an ecosystem interact and supply the needs of the living things. Recall that plants need the abiotic factor to survive like what, including soil, sunlight, air, and water, the plants need all these abiotic factors in order to survive. Also, the plants in turn provide food for most of the animals in an ecosystem. Okay, then we move to another part. The organisms in an ecosystem can be sorted into different populations. So what is a population? A population includes all members of a single species, a single kind or a single type of organisms in an area at a given time. Again, a population is or a population includes all the members of a single species in an area at a given time. For example, the blue sprouts trees, this is a special type or this is a single species of trees in a forest to form a population. Also look carefully at these three pictures. Yes, if you saw any one of these, you will say this is a butterfly. Yes, but these are three very different species of butterflies. Each species forms its own population. The first one is the monarch butterfly. This is named the monarch butterfly. The second one is named the painted lady butterfly. And the third one is the buckeye butterfly. Each one of them forms a separate butterfly population in an ecosystem. This is so important because they are different species. Okay, together, the many different populations make up a community. So the community consists of many populations. A community includes all the living things in an ecosystem. Do you remember the biotic factors? This is the community. In addition to plants and animals, a community may also have bacteria, protists, and fungi as well. For example, the soil of a forest community. In this, inside the soil itself, it has huge populations of mold and the bacteria that live together. The living community of most ecosystems might include thousands of populations. Can you imagine this? Okay. The ecosystem can be local or widespread. The ecosystem can be very small or covering a huge area. An entire forest, for example, uh, that covers a huge area can be an ecosystem. And also one fallen log in the middle of the forest can also make up an ecosystem. Can you see this tree trunk that already is dead and fell to the ground? Some other organisms like these mushrooms and this grass would grow up on this log or this trunk. So this is a very small ecosystem. Okay, then we move to another part, which is how are food chains alike? 
how are food chains alike. The path that the energy and the nutrients follow in an ecosystem is called food chain. So first we need to know what is the meaning of the word food chain itself. So a food chain is the path, the way that the energy and the nutrients follow in an ecosystem. Food chains model the feeding relationships between organisms in an ecosystem. Energy flows in one direction in food chain from one organism to another. Once the energy is used by the organism, it leaves the organism's body as heat and it becomes unavailable for the other organisms in the ecosystem. Like when you eat your food, you use the energy from this food. Once you finish or use up all the energy, it will never be available and it will get out of your body as heat. The energy in a food chain starts with the sun because the sun is the energy source for almost all the organisms on earth. Producers are organisms that use the energy from the sun to make the sugar and the oxygen in the process of photosynthesis. I think you can recall the process of photosynthesis using the sunlight energy combined with carbon dioxide and water to make sugar or food and oxygen. The producers, they are at the base of every food chain because producers are the only organisms that can use energy from sunlight to make their own food. Then during photosynthesis, the producers such as plants and algae build sugar molecules out of carbon dioxide and water, okay? The sugar molecules are the original source of food for consumers. So what are consumers? A consumer is any animal that eats plants or other animals. So a consumer is an animal or any animal that eats plants or other animals. Look at this picture carefully. So the plants are the producers. All these plants, they are producers. Then what eats the producers? This is a primary consumer. We will study its name later. Then we move to, this is the bobcat, which is the secondary consumer. Also, we have decomposers. We will study all of them in detail. Okay, so the animals that eat producers, they are called herbivores. Herbivores. Herbivores include squirrels, some birds, some insects, and grazing animals like cattle, sheep, cows, and buffaloes, or these are named grazing animals. So the herbivores are the animals that eat only producers. For example, the squirrels, some birds, some insects, and the grazing animals. Animals that eat other animals, they are called carnivores. So carnivores are animals that eat other animals, like the bobcats and hawks. These are carnivores. Also, we come to another type of consumers. These are named omnivores. Omnivores. Omnivores are animals that eat both plants and other animals. Animals that eat both plants and other animals, they are named carnivores. Uh, omnivores, I'm sorry. Raccoons, mice, and some crabs, these are omnivores. Raccoons, mice, and some crabs, these are omnivores. There are also decomposers in the food chain. Do you remember the picture? We also have decomposers in the food chain. What are decomposers? Decomposers break down the dead or decaying plant and animal material. So they only deal with the dead or decaying plant and animal materials. Like what decomposers include fungi, bacteria, termites, and the many worm species. Decomposers include fungi, bacteria, termites, and the many worm species. Also, we have scavengers in the food chain. What are scavengers? Scavengers. A scavenger is a consumer that eats the remains of dead animals that it didn't hunt or kill. This is the most important part of the definition. Scavengers, this is a consumer. Scavenger is a consumer that eats the remains of dead animals that it didn't hunt or kill. Common scavengers include vultures, raccoons, jackals, crows, and some crabs. Okay. So a scavenger, for example, imagine that there was a lion that already hunted a deer and started to feed on the deer. So the lion is a carnivore, the deer is a herbivore. Okay, 
but the lion didn't finish up the whole deer. It left some parts, some remains. Then come another animal like a vulture or a raccoon that eats the remains of this deer. So in this case, huh, the carnivore is the lion, but the scavenger is the vulture and the raccoons because they are eating from a dead animal that it didn't hunt or kill. This is so important to know. Okay. In most food chains, a single organism is not eaten by only one consumer. So we'll move to another part named food webs. Food webs. So in most food chains, a single organism is not eaten by only one consumer. For example, a mouse. A mouse may be eaten by a bobcat by a, or a hawk or a snake. So in this case, the mouse is a part of many separate food chains. These chains can be combined to form a bigger food web. So do you mean that the food web consists of many food chains? Yes, for sure. Let's see. A food web is a network of food chains that have some links in common. A food web is a network of food chains that have some links in common. A food web may look complicated, but they are just several food chains and the food chains are easy to study. So, but the food webs are just several food chains that are put together. So how do we read the food web? Let's see. Listen carefully to this part. This is so important. As the food, as with food chains, the arrows representing to the arrows representing to the energy flow from one organism to another. Yes, we have arrows in the food chain from one organism to another, representing or referring to the energy flow from one organism to the other one. But the arrows pointing to an organism show the living thing that the organism eats. So the arrow pointing to an organism shows the living things that an organism eats. But the arrows pointing away from an organism show the animal that eats the organism. The arrows pointing away from an organism show the animal that eats the organism. Okay. In the diagram in the next part, huh, arrows pointing to the hawk show that it hunts fish, mice, and the small birds. So let's look at the picture. So this is the hawk. The arrows pointing to the hawk tells us that the, the hawk hunts the small birds. Also, it hunts the mouse. It hunts the fish. Okay. Then what is a predator? A predator is a living thing that hunts and kills other living things for food. So a predator is an animal or a living thing that hunt and kill other animals. Why? In order to get food. So these are predators. Okay, the top carnivores are the highest level predators in a food web. Top carnivores are the highest level predators in a food web. The arrows pointing away from the mouse. Look, the arrows pointing away from the mouse tell us that the mouse is eaten or hunted by a raccoon, a bobcat, or even by a hawk. Okay, so the arrows pointing away from the mouse shows that or show that it is hunted by the hawk, hawks, raccoons, and the bobcats. We already started the predators. So what about the prey? The prey is the prey are organisms that are eaten by predators. Prey are organisms that are be, be eaten by predators. So predators are important in food webs and food chains. Why the predators are important? Because they limit the size of prey populations. Because they limit the size of prey populations. When the number of prey animals is reduced, when the number of prey animals is reduced, producers and the other resources in an ecosystem are less likely to run out. Imagine that in an ecosystem that we have plenty of producers and we have also some sheep. So the food is enough for the sheep. Then the sheep start to reproduce and grow larger in size or in number also. So in this case, the food will not be enough. So having a prey in this, uh, having a predator in this ecosystem, it will 
limit the size of prey population, control the size of the prey population. So when the number of the prey animals is reduced, producers and the other resources will not run out. Okay. Then we move to the energy pyramids. What are the energy pyramids? An energy pyramid is a diagram that shows the amount of energy available to each level of an ecosystem. An energy pyramid is a diagram that shows the amount of energy available at each level of an ecosystem. So do you remember when we said that the producers use the energy from sunlight to perform a photosynthesis? So let's ask ourselves how much of the sun's original energy actually gets used during photosynthesis. Okay, in fact, only about 10% of the sun's energy gets turned into food by the producer. When a producer is eating, about 10% of the food energy it contains is turned into the consumer tissue. So this is 10% of, of the previous 10%. So the amount of available energy becomes less and less moving from one organism to another. Okay. What about the rest? We said that 10% is used. 10% is turned into, huh? It's about 10% of the food energy gets turned into the consumer tissue. Okay, what about the 90%? The rest is used when the organism performs its life processes, its daily activities, and the sum of it is released as heat. Okay, for example, the butterfly drinks the nectar, the sweet liquid from the flowers to get the energy. The butterfly's body then uses the energy to support its life processes. And this is our energy pyramid. The base of any energy pyramid is always producers, then herbivores, then carnivores, and the top carnivores like the bobcat at the top, okay? Each level gets 10% of energy from the previous one. So as we go up, the energy becomes less. That's why the bobcat needs to eat more than one other carnivore like the, the birds in order to get enough energy. And what about this heat? We said that each organism, when it performs its daily activities and the life processes, it uses the energy and this is released as heat. Okay, then how do energy pyramids compare? If only 10% of the plant tissue gets turned into the butterfly tissue, the 90% of the plant's energy is not used by the butterfly. Yes, we already studied this part. This pattern continues with each level of an energy pyramid. When a bird eats a butterfly, it obtains even less energy. This is what we said. 10% of the 10% of the 10%. So, so each level gets much smaller amount of energy. At each stage, about 90% of the energy, of the available energy is not utilized. What do we mean by this? It means that most feeding patterns are not very efficient. Energy pyramids illustrate that it takes a huge number of organisms to support an ecosystem. Yes, this is what we said. Each level needs to eat more of the previous level in order to support its life functions. The bottom of the energy pyramid represents the producers. We said the producers are at the base of anything, any food chain, food web, or even an energy pyramid. The bottom is the largest level because it contains the most organisms and therefore the most energy. There are fewer numbers of organisms and the less available energy at each level of the pyramid as we are moving from the bottom to the top. In any ecosystem, the number of producers is greater than the number of herbivores. Yes, for sure. And also the number of herbivores is many more than the number of carnivores. For example, in a forest, there are more flowers than the butterflies and more butterflies than the insects and birds or than the birds that eat the butterflies. And there are many more birds than the bobcats, which are the top carnivores. Okay, have you asked yourself before what would happen if there is a change 
in a food web or what does a change, how does a change affect a food web? Let's see. Most ecosystems stay in balance most of the time. Most ecosystems are working perfectly most of the time. But what happens when a top carnivore is removed? If you remove the bobcat from an ecosystem or what happens when a population in a food web increases in number? Let's see what would happen. These changes set off a chain of events that affect all the organisms in a food web. These changes set off a chain of events that affect all the organisms in a food web. How? When the top carnivores are removed from the food chain, do you remember when we said that the predators limit the prey population? They control the number of prey in a population. This is so important. So when the top carnivores are removed from a food chain, prey populations are no longer controlled. So they can reproduce without limits. And this is a major problem. When prey populations increase in number, more producers are needed or required to supply them with energy. For example, if you removed the bobcat from the forest food web, so the birds, mice, and raccoons would increase. These are all types of herbivores. So soon there would be less grass, trees, and other producers to support the ecosystem. So the ecosystem will collapse. Okay, another example. This is a red tide algae. Can you see this red part? This is the shore. This is part of the sea. This is the shore, the beach. This is the land and all this is the sea. So what about this red water? This is the case that we are talking about. Sometimes a single population can grow out of control or it is named a sudden explosive growth. What happened here? A red tide is a sudden explosive growth of a single celled algae in coastal areas. So what happened? The red tides can occur when the nutrient-rich deep water gets brought to the surface after a storm. With, with so many nutrients in the water, the algae keep reproducing. Then the toxins produced by the algae can cause the organism that eat the algae, such as the small fish, to die. So we already removed part of the food web, which is the small fish. This reduces the food energy available for the predators who eat the fish. So we killed or we damaged the food web by this red tide algae. What happened after a storm? The deep water nutrient rich, huh? the deep nutrient rich water are brought to the surface. So the algae started to reproduce too much, too much food. So it will reproduce too much. Then this algae, this red algae produced toxins that will eat any organism that, that will kill any organism that eats this algae, like the small fish. Then when the small fish are dead, what about the larger fish, the predators that eat the small ones? So this is a damage to a food web. I hope you understood the whole lesson. Thank you very much. See you inshallah in the next one. Thank you guys.